We're proud to have this episode sponsored by ShakePay, the easiest way for Canadians to buy and earn Bitcoin. I love using ShakePay because it's fast, it's easy, the app is great, and it doesn't hurt that they give away free sats, which is free Bitcoin every day just for shaking your phone. They also have the ShakePay prepaid Visa card issued by People's Trust that earns you up to 2% cash back in Bitcoin. Not points you have to redeem, just Bitcoin added to your account automatically. Like I said, ShakePay really is the easiest way for Canadians to buy and earn Bitcoin. So join the over 1 million Canadians already on ShakePay. Sign up is fast and free. It's so easy, a boomer can do it. Plus, sign up for ShakePay with the promo code LOONIEHOUR and you'll receive $10 after you buy your first $100 worth of Bitcoin. That's promo code LOONIEHOUR. Thank you, ShakePay. Now back to the show. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that this information discussed today is not intended to be or construed as investment advice. Please consult a professional advisor before putting a loony in any of these financial markets. The dirty secret is that no one's ever going to get paid back or have the shortest memories when it comes to investment. We just got to get Keith into Bitcoin. Hey, there's a bubble. Welcome back to the Looney Hour, episode 66. As always, joined by the three amigos, we've got Rich Diaz of Acorn Macro Consulting and Keith Dicker, everyone's favorite boomer of Ice Cap Asset Management. Welcome back to the show, gentlemen. Keith, how you doing? Yo, good, good. I had to, you know, I'm tired from last night's epic Q&A. That was lots of fun. I don't know if we had very many good A's, but the questions were pretty cool. Yeah, we it was a good turnout. We added a couple hundred on the YouTube live stream, you know, another hundred on the on the Zoom call there. So it was uh yeah, appreciate everyone coming out. Lots of good questions. We're gonna do more of those. Um, we'll actually post the full QA. It's about an hour and a half. Um, we'll post that the recording on YouTube as well. So if you wanna go back and listen to that, that'll be available as well. I think one thing we need to do and uh Maybe we can set up like a uh, hangout with Rich event at the Stampede, something to that effect. Because I thought of it after. What a great idea. I think the Stampede would be fun. I've never been there. But I think having Rich at the Stampede, that would make it funner. That would be amazing. I'd love to go. We should do a Looney Hour Live um, in Calgary in July. Not that I'm not throwing that out there, but... I don't know. It'd be amazing. I'd love now. to go. It's like it's like a major Canadiana event. I think if you're Canadian, you have to go to these things. So why not? Yeah, we'd actually yeah. like uh, if you guys can comment. Like you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'd love to hear some commentary or even just email us, like Calgary, because we don't. Uh, yeah, our our largest audience base is is in, is in Toronto, followed by Vancouver. Hence, we've done the last two events there. But I think Calgary's up there, maybe third or fourth. So um, yeah, if that would interest you, you know, Calgary in the summer, somewhere fun. Uh, that's that's probably where the next Looney Hour live event will be. But um, Rich, what else is going on? Oh, nothing. Nothing on the dating front. Sorry to disappoint everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a lazy it's been a lazy week. Uh somehow I haven't done any work and I haven't you gone haven't out. been swiping no, this was, week, eh? No, no, I haven't been swiping. I haven't swiped. <laughs> <laughs> no, sadly, I'm still uh all alone here with a broken heart. So there you go. Not nothing, nothing doing. Nothing doing. All Sorry alone with a broken heart, just watching, sitting there waiting for the CPI prints to come out. That's right. That's right. I've been doing lots of charts though, so that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're going to jump into that because we're, uh, you know, as Keith likes to say, we're recording this on Thursday. And of course, the uh, US CPI inflation data came out today. Um, so Rich, I don't know if you want to walk us through that, but it was uh, more or less in line with sort of expectations. And then, you know, we'll get into some of the market reactions on that front as well from Keith. Sure. I mean, inflation in the US, um, I think fell to uh, 6.4. So that's the headline number. Um, the core fell to 5.7, um, sort of as expected. I think it was exactly in line. Or it was off by just 0 0.1. Um, so that's, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I probably screwed that up. But, you know, so that's, that's okay. I think, you know, I think the market's response is kind of muted. I think it's, I think people are just, I think I'm frankly tired of talking about it. Um, I think the argument now is like whether or not it'll continue to fall. We were asked about it last night about whether it's going to go below 2% by the end of this year. I'm below in the camp three. That's I think not, we had below oh, sorry, three. below three. Okay. I'm in the camp that that's not going to happen. I think the market expectations or, or the aggregation of all of the um, economists have it falling down precipitously. 
I'm not exactly sure. The reason I'm not sure is because of that shelter component. Now you can say, Rich, that shelter component's lagging. It's not appropriate. It's this or that. I mean, that them's the numbers and that's the math. So you can, you're welcome, I'm sure, to write a letter to uh, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics or BEA or whoever puts those numbers together and argue your case. But the reality is, is that the shelter component rose again and contributed again a significant amount to the core Lag. component. Flag, sure, whatever, but it's since shelter rose to 7.5. The number that I'm looking at a lot is um, is the services component, which admittedly is, is dominated by that shelter, but again, continued to rise. Remember, services are stickier than goods. Goods we're going to see come down significantly. And on that note, um, you know, just like in Canada or in Europe or whatever, the CPI is broken up into different components. So energy, shelter, food, medical, um, new vehicles, used vehicles, apparel, commodities, et cetera. And the biggest drag month on month by far was energy commodities. So, I mean, you know what that is. It's fuel, it's for your car, it's diesel, it's, it's fuel to burn for in your house while we still have uh, <laughs> natural gas hobs. Um, but, hobs? Is that a stove? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I never heard that before. Um, but the, I would just be very careful to, to, you know, put all your eggs into the energy commodities falling and dragging down that headline number. I mean, that's why you look at core and on that, la on that core um, over the next couple of days, we're going to get the following three or four indicators that I'll be paying close attention to, which is median CPI from the Cleveland fed trimmed mean PCE from the Dallas fed and sticky inflation from the Atlanta fed. And those three, I think will tell us a lot more about what's going on in the inflation world than what we saw today. Yeah, that's good. Good summary. Keith, do you want to jump in? I've got some comments as well, but I, I kind of want to get a bit of your, uh, your thoughts. Cause we chatted a little bit last night on the, on the live stream about some of our views on inflation, but uh, why don't you step in here? Yeah. So what I found uh, interesting with, with the inflation numbers this morning, uh, finally the analyst estimates have caught up with the actual data coming through. So I think I expressed my uh, frustrations before that the Canadian data, you know, relative to estimates, it's all over the map. It's, it's, it's very difficult in Canada to really be surprised or not surprised. You're either surprised that the real number is so different than the estimate, or you're surprised that the estimate was so different than the real number. See what I mean, Rich? Rich got to get that one around his head. He's thinking about it. And uh, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's, it's, that's what's so awesome about, about this show. Sometimes it means nothing. Uh, but again, just to be to be clear, what finally happened this morning, because every month, you know, we're getting the CPI data coming in then some ISM numbers are, are coming in and, and stuff like that. And, and I find like over the last four to five months, especially, um, analysts the, the real numbers have been more dovish than what analysts were expecting so it, usually it, it was i should say and it's because this huge market reaction because it's like oh man we weren't expecting that today's cpi data was was largely in line there, there are no real surprises with it um so that tells me okay we're now set up we're moving in line again with uh we're analysts are expecting we're going to go so maybe there will not be any more surprises coming up and uh so that's the main observation here there hasn't been a big market reaction from it um you know some of the headline news stories they're trying to make something out of it but the you know the, the top line here the rate of price increases is slowing um but they're, they're still pretty high i know last night on the q a i think we had a What's the question? What we thought if inflation get to two percent by year end or something? Yeah, and I think we said would inflation fall at some point in twenty twenty three? Would it fall below three percent, under three? And and yeah. you and I, I think that was in Canada, right? For Canada, yeah. Okay, and I Canada. think Steve Steve predicted that the bottom inflation would be in September, <laughs> September and, and September fifteenth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Rich was on the other side, uh, um, but you know, I, I think what we're expecting now and, and again keep coming back and moving away from the inflation number a little bit is this whole recession story it's just fascinating we've we've gone from in a few months well you think about over the last six to eight months there was no recession it's just going to be a slowdown and then we got into the fall it's like oh yeah man we're going to have a recession and it's going to it's going to be a big recession to now we're back to maybe there's no recession coming anywhere 
And it is, again, I just find that fascinating and it's going to have a, a big effect now with what central banks are doing. And I'm coming around now back to the idea that uh, now that everyone seems highly convinced where everything is going, I think things are going to surprise on a different, a different perspective again. And I continue to believe that the the opportunity for the Federal Reserve to continue hiking a lot higher than what's expected right now, that, that that's likely going to be the shock this year. And, uh, you know, get ready for it. It's going to be a good ride as, as we go down that, that that's road. Some, that's some interesting commentary because I think, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong based on this. So I know you were saying that the inflation print today was kind of aligned with in line with estimates. But I, I mean, I thought like the estimates were, were fairly aggressive, right? I mean, I think they were setting it up for a negative uh, move, negative what, 0.1% uh in inflation of a month over month and which we actually hit. So you kind of have like, I mean, technically you have deflation. I wouldn't definitely would not call it that, but, um, the technical it term in- is disinflation or <laughs> disinflation. Um, but Keith, they, um, rich, rich means like disdating. You know? <laughs> it's not that he's not oh dating. He's just God. disdating. It's slow. That's, right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, and then you had a whole bunch of, you know, all these uh, sort of economists getting quoted in Bloomberg and stuff coming out and saying, well, you know, the Fed now has a clear case to do 25 basis points, sort of these smaller rate hikes moving forward. So, Keith, I, I mean, obviously, you know, what you're saying definitely sort of is maybe against what mainstream is now coming out and suggesting. Um, so that that's certainly going to be interesting. Are you just of the view that they'll, just, they'll basically just keep going 25, 25, 25 until, until you know, kind of something hits the fan yeah effectively i mean I, I think they i think i know they want to continue tightening the economy so that we do get job losses you know wage growth slows because of demand and, and stuff like that and and we're not there so that's not happening so therefore that's we're going to uh continue to go that down that road so uh, yeah we're prepared for the fed to be tightening longer than than what everyone's expecting right now and you know just if everyone to realize here because you know we're doing this every week and we're like we're really good at it uh but, <laughs> but there's been a lot of shifting with expectations what central banks are going to be doing or or, or not doing and I, i've never seen this kind of volatility with, with central bank policy because usually it's something that's you know let's face it it's pretty snoozy and uh you know we, we've turned a snoozy boring event into like uh, an exciting cool event you know to, to listen to but that's where we are right now and, and again like it's we're not finished this cycle yet it's going to get going and we haven't even talked about Canada because I think we need to jump over to what happened in Sweden a couple of days ago and uh, I think that would give a good I didn't even know what happened to Sweden so please enlighten me oh Oh, go for it. What do we do with this guy, Rich? What do we what do we do? I yeah, I, think, I was not paying attention. I'm in my own okay. we forgive you. housing bubble over here. <laughs> in Kitslano. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. In Kitslano. Yeah. Uh, do you want to go rich or do you want me to no no you go for it and I'll comment after? Okay. Do you even do you even know what I'm gonna say? Yeah, that they're that, that central oh, okay. banks should not be involved <laughs> that central banks are not should not be involved in climate change, which is I think I, a huge I thought it was gap. one gonna be one of those things where like we have no idea what boomer's gonna say. Let's just say <laughs> let him go with it. And let let him go. Or, yeah. No, no, no. I th- well, I mean, I'll, now that I've started, I might as well finish. So basically there was lots of there was probably some uh, central bank, you know, uh, party going on in Sweden. And each of the central banks, I can't remember, I don't know exactly how many spoke, but I, I imagine it's you know probably half a dozen or maybe all of them. Um, they all come and they do their shtick and they probably have these like working groups and they, you know, exchange numbers and who knows what happens uh, in the evenings. Um, but they were uh, one of the things that I took away from it, uh, besides the Fed's commitment to independence, was basically him coming out and in no uncertain terms saying that central banks have absolutely no business um, broadening the scope to address important social issues of the day, e.g., climate change. And I think that's a really, really interesting kind of salvo across, you know, um, the people who say, you know, central banks should be using their power, whether it's financial conditions, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's restrictions on certain funding or um, how much weight is put on a particular amount of collateral and, and basically getting involved in, in climate change debate. 
Um, the ECB, in, in their infinite wisdom, of course, push back because, well, say it, let you say do. it, come on, <laughs> say it. Because the ECB say is it. in economic, economic fantasy land. Um, the ECB remains absolutely committed to the cause, um, led by convicted felon Christine Lagarde. And um, and it's, I, I'd love to hear you guys' view on this, but I think um, it is a very, very dangerous game when unelected technocrats um, are effectively pushing what should be in the purview of a legislative um, uh, a legislative uh, body or what, legis what legislation basically outside of their, their, their sort of narrow do domain. Um, that was pretty yeah, good. Chime in. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't, did they, did they explicitly come out and say like ESG? I'm just curious or like climate change or what? what? They did. He did not say yeah. climate change change specifically what he said was um what i referenced which was important <laughs> i mean the writings on uh, to broaden the scope and address um, other important social issues of the day that's the quote i mean he's talking about climate change yeah basically and they're also talking i mean because one thing with central banks like over the last few years especially that they they've been somehow they've shifted from looking at just what they've always looked at to trying to include like ec economic inequality uh, ESG type stuff and, and all that. And, and then, you know, all of a sudden they're going to change interest rates to create more oil. You know, it's just, it's just bizarre where they've gone. So I, I thought it was a very important speech by the Fed and Powell that he basically reset expectations again. He said, you know what, we're going to become a serious central bank again, uh, to which I'm sure some people listening are saying, <laughs> were they ever serious to start with? But, but jokes aside, uh, you know, we can, you know, believe and say what we want about the Federal Reserve, you know, with the American Central Bank. But it is the most important central bank in the world. It, and it's important you need to understand what they are doing because it does affect all of us. Uh, meanwhile, we had, you know, the Canadians were over there as well. And uh, they, they were more of the European view. And again, so I remember attending a Bank of Canada uh, meeting or not a meeting, I should say, a, a presentation there a few years ago. So this would have been it at the end of 2019. So in, I think, December it was exactly. And even then, they had uh, climate change policies on their spreadsheet of the effect it was going to have on the economy and then what they needed to do to, to combat it. So the bottom line is, you know, because it's, it's a very important um concept or, or factor for the Canadian government and it's it's inside a Canadian central bank as well so we should expect that to continue to happen going forward and um, you know I, again I, th I think the Bank of Canada they're always looking for a reason to remain hawkish whereas a lot of other central banks are looking for a reason you know to be, to be dovish and uh, so we'll get back to what the you know the Bank of Canada is going to do coming up soon but I, I thought the Swedish meeting, uh, it, it didn't give a lot of meat for the markets because everyone's expecting Powell to say something about the economy. And because um, I don't think ever before was the world tuned in to some, you know, central bank being taking place in, in Sweden. By the way, if you've ever been to Stockholm, if you haven't been, you should go. Stockholm is, is a great little city to hang out in and, and to have, uh, you know, some fun. Um, yeah. Yeah, can, I just correct, can, I can I correct the record? Sorry, I... I... I misspoke. Um, he does specifically and explicitly address climate change. He says addressing climate change seems likely to require policies that would have significant distributional and other effects on companies, industries, regions, and nations. And my, the more important point for me is decisions about policies to directly address climate change should be made at, by elected branches of government and thus reflect the public's will as expressed through elections. Now, it's amazing that he should have to even say that. I think that that is kind of patently obvious to anyone who looks at these things. But indeed, he felt that he needed to, I think. And it was very, very good. Remember, uh, central banks have been struggling with not only credibility um, with respect to fighting inflation and forecasting inflation, the whole transitory, non-transitory BS that we had to deal with last year, but also... Um, the idea that they're no longer independent. That's the other battle that they're sort of fighting. That's the, we talk about credibility, but also independence. And so this is, a, I think it has a lot to do with 
fighting for that independence. And, and he does indeed go address that specific point as well in his speech. It was a very, very short speech. You can find it online. But sorry, I just wanted to correct. In, my, I mean, my screw it, up yeah, there. I was, I was going to say, I mean, independence. I mean, when you're monetizing, you know, 40 percent of, of of all government debt, I mean, the Bank of Canada at one point, I don't know where they're at now, but they own 40 percent of all outstanding uh, government debt. So and, and you know, they Japan, purchased 92 Canada purchased at one point. China, China, Canada produced, sorry, assumed or absorbed 92 percent of all bond issuance. And it went up almost to 100 during certain points of the pandemic. That is debt monetization. Uh, that is like crystal clear debt monetization. Sorry, Steve, but just yeah. I mean, I think it's just. I think the idea of being independent is kind of is kind of toast. I know Keith, you're saying the Fed is maybe trying to get back there, but it is funny because like on the day that you know the CPI report comes out today, you know uh, Biden's giving a, a you know speech saying, hey, you know the job is 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 getting done and inflation is coming down. So yeah, I think there's a lot of political pressure. Um, it's funny. I'm just reading that, that, that book, uh, that Paul Volcker book right now, just, you know, he, and he kind of talks about, you know, the, the political influence that ultimately led to higher inflation because nobody really wanted to sort of beat down if nobody wanted, no central banker at the time before he got in wanted to actually do the hard work, um, because it was so politically unpopular. There's a lot of political pressure. <clears throat> so, I mean, I think that's obviously where, where we've been. I got a couple of quick notes here just to kind of talk about, you know, the Fed and, and some of their credibility. And again, I know we kind of want to get away from the, the inflation stuff, but just on the services inflation, the shelter inflation, um, there was an article in Bloomberg uh, today, actually, they were talking about that the Fed is now created. And again, maybe this is getting back to the whole credibility because I think they've got, you know, egg on their face over the last 24 months, right? Which is, hey, inflation's transitory. Don't worry about it. Because they've actually come out with... Um, a new measure to to sort of try to track uh, rental inflation. So it's basically they're calling it the, it's called a new tenant repeat uh, rent index. So basically, just they're basically just taking new uh, rental contracts and saying, okay, can you say that the, again? It's called the new tenant repeat. Yeah rent index that's not what i heard <laughs> anyways versus the all tenant repeat rent and in, rent index so it's essentially but basically they're saying they're just looking at new uh rental i just contracts. want you to repeat the the name of it again yeah i know thanks a lot they're basically just looking at the new rental contracts um to say okay what's what's the rate of increase on these new contracts we don't want to go back and look at you know contracts that are five, 10 years old, whatever. Um, so, you know, th that was number one. And then number two, as I found it interesting, was the uh, the Fed, they call him the Fed Whisperer, this, this Nick Nick guy, Nick Timiras. I don't even know, I'm going to butcher it. Nick at the Wall Street Journal. So he posted um, some a new research from the, from the Fed where he says, you know, Fed economists, so they say home price gains over the last two years could have produced a wealth effect for homeowners that drove one third of the increase in the CPI non-shelter prices. So he's basically saying the home price gains that created this wealth effect over the last two years basically are responsible for one third of the entire in increase in inflation. I'd like to remind, uh, so thank you for sharing that. I didn't actually catch that, Steve, but I'd like to remind everybody about the article that we debated on this podcast a couple of weeks ago, where we were told that there was absolutely no effect from from these uh, from a lot of these policies. Um, do, you, do you guys remember that? I think it was that a was the weeks online ago. guy, right? The, yeah, the, that was. I'm, let's not mention his name, but. It was just so. Can you can you actually just repeat that one more time, Steve? Just oh those yeah, that guy sucks. I think those... Let's not talk about him. <laughs> can you just repeat the those those numbers? Because sometimes they're a bit they're a bit pit, tricky to to. Well, repeat the name uh, of the index first. I think that's yeah. important for us to get yeah. used to saying it. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> do you want me just to repeat this headline, or I don't, I don't know. Go for it. Go for it. I'm curious about this. I haven't heard about it before. Uh, okay. I mean, I can read the whole thing for you. He says. Uh, role of house price growth in explaining recent inflation. We can use our estimates to calculate the contribution of house price growth to national non-shelter inflation between Feb 2020 and Feb 2022, multiplying the increase in national house prices over this time period by the elasticity estimate from column one of table two. We find that house price growth increased the national 
non-shelter CPI by four log points, which is 39% of the total increase in national non-shelter CPI over this time period. So cool. Thank you. There you go. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you could take this exact same thing and apply it to, you know, our, our housing bubble that we've got here, which is much larger than the U S which is everyone, what everyone is concerned about. So, I mean, you know, the, the home price inflation that we actually saw in Canada was actually significantly larger during the pandemic than it was in the U S as well. I think at one point, I think the, the, um, the national house price index in Canada, I think it peaked out, I believe, on a year-over-year rate of change. I think it reached 26% growth, annual growth at one point, which is just like mind-blowing for a national index. You know, it might be, you might see that, you know, in part of a Halifax or one part of Vancouver, but to see like a national index increase by 26%. So yeah, the wealth effect that's been derived from that, um, you know, clearly we saw a lot of people tapping into their new equity, refinancing, going and using the, that new cash to to buy a secondary rental property, which ultimately you know added stoked demand, uh, you know, created more competition for housing, vacations, boats, cars, you name it. I mean, you know, use car. I mean, how much, how much did car prices go up? Right. I mean, how much of that is because people are like, Hey, I can, I got all this free cash running around. It's tough to split it out. It's tough to split it out. Part of that is the the supply stuff. Part of it is you're absolutely right. The wealth effect. I'm just, just for the record, just so we don't get any comments. It's it's very difficult to, to use some analysis on the U S housing and directly transpose it onto the Canadian housing market. So we just need to be very careful about that. But I think broad strokes, I think the conclusion is a really good one, which is clearly there was an enormous impact on inflation from the wealth effect. Now what the numbers are in Canada or what have you, I think that's a different conversation for a different day, but to ignore it, I think would be wrong. Well, I think it also comes back to how money is created, right? Which is through right. through the creation of new loans, right? Through through debt issuance, through people taking out mortgages, you create uh, new credit, new money into the system. And so, yeah, I mean, that's predominantly done through residential mortgages in Canada. Um, Keith, I don't know if you've got any comments on yeah, that. Yeah, but. go for it. I'm just agreeing with what I'm hearing here. I'm not hearing anything that's unusual. And it's it's a great point. Because one thing though, like, you know, so when central banks look at this, you know, they'll say, okay, you know, we look at the total wealth for the country or the economy. Uh, you know, if you look at all the assets, you know, real estate is a huge part of it. People's investment portfolios are a huge part. So they really appreciate the wealth effect. So whether it's coming from the housing side or the stock market or from you know something else, uh, on an aggregate basis, they don't care. Then they want to look in, okay, can we, you know, hold it down a little bit? But uh, you know, the concern that every because I know I know the American housing market, it is coming off. Like the, the data is there to show it. Um, you know, it is softer up here as well. So it, it is a good point to make. Uh, not related to this, I want to make one more comment though about, about the whole Swedish meetings that they had. Um, just so that everyone might, if you, if you may or may not understand it, when, when the central bank, when they take the side that they need to help fight climate change, it means they want to slow down the economy. They, they want to reduce the amount of economic output that, that's coming out. Because in theory, it means there's less but you think that's you think that's the, the angle. Air. That's interesting yeah. that you think that's, that's the, the angle. Well, I don't know what else they could do because they can't. You know, they can influence maybe commercial banks on how they lend, but they can't really do that. Uh, so that's the purpose of the whole ESG scoring system. You know, you want to you want to penalize banks for lending, you know, to the dirty industries and re reward them for you know lending to the cleaner industries. But from a remember central banks, you know, they work with a sledgehammer, you know, they don't have the little scalpel and screwdrivers and, and stuff. Um, so like it's the big smash bang, that's what they'll do. So in Canada, that's what they would uh in and for the Europeans, of course. Um where do we want to go next? So we just did want to talk about Japan next, the big Japanese news. 
I don't know Did what the big see- Japanese news is. Sorry. Yeah, I was gonna say, geez, am I am I out of touch here? I know it's just early January here, but what's what's going on in Japan? It doesn't seem like tell us, Pop. Like, <laughs> tell us, Pop. <laughs> <laughs> well, back when I was a boy, um, you know, like Boomer was up late last night, and I was still able to get up early enough to to catch up on all the news. And because uh, it was kind of one of the questions last night was referencing, uh, you know, where might you know stress re-escalate first you know japan or, or europe you know, we, we had that conversation last night and uh you know and and one of the answers that we had last night was that you know that the, the japanese are already hinting that they're 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 already experienced a lot of stress and they're trying to do things to, to counter it you know to hold things together now this morning in uh, the bank of japan they announced that they are now reviewing uh what the side effects have been of their monetary policy over the last what, 500 years, almost it seems like now, uh, which the market took for, you know, they want to move away from, um, you know, all the shenanigans they've been doing to become actually more hawkish. So this morning, I mean, Japanese yen is up 2% this morning. Um, the equity market is down about one and a half. The 10 year is, is down another 1%. And so you, you have, again, you have all these big movements happening in Japan. And as Canadians, again, we need to understand and appreciate that the, these movements outside the country, that is what could ultimately spark, you know, some kind of a, a risk off event taking place. But if you're the Japanese right now, you're looking around, you see the Europeans, you know, they're saying, hey, we're going to raise rates into a recession uh we're not afraid to do it we have our own reasons i have my own my own reasons i suspect as well what, why they're doing it but uh they're saying hey this is this might be our only chance to try to normalize interest rates everyone else is doing it and they're, they're not really getting penalized for it so this is this is our chance if we don't do it now we may never get to do it so we could continue to have some big news coming out of Japan over the next few weeks, or maybe this is it, you know, maybe their review, you know, they suddenly realize, hey, that they can't go on this path. And what, what the path is, by the way, is that they will allow their, uh, their yield curve or long-term rates to go higher than what it currently is. Because right now it's not being marked correctly with, with price discovery. And um, if they want to do that, it just means they have to use even more QE they have to print more money to try to prevent it from really slingshotting higher. So, uh, and again, keep your eye on Japan. It's, they've, um, they've got a mess. new central bank minister coming in, no? In March? Is it March? Yeah. The, the so current March. guy is about Kuroda. 400 years old. And the, the, new, <laughs> the newer guy, he's a, he's a young fella. I think he's 340. But, uh, you know, jokes aside, though, Kuroda is, is his stint is coming up. It, it's over. But, you know, they, they've had a real struggle now for probably 30 years almost. And um, so it, it's significant what they're trying to do. I, I think, you know, there's no way they can get out of where they are, but they're going to try. And that's what I got to do, Rich. You just got to try. Get out there. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Keith, you want to touch on, um, there's a little bit of news here. I know we're, we're you know, talking about central banks and, and rates as we always do. But, you know, there was some commentary the other day from all these big Canadian bank CEOs, um, you know, coming out about, uh, I can read it to you. Um, so this is from CIBC. This is from CIBC CEO. There was some sort of conference where they were all in a room together. Uh, he says, this is not a bank credit issue. This is an issue of consumer lifestyle. More money will have to go from discretionary spending to interest expense. Um, and then BMO's CEO, Daryl White, uh, he put that they're basically 1% of their, their their sort of residential mortgage book is, uh, so I don't know the right term, but basically under, under pressure or under careful watching, basically he says low single digit percentage range are vulnerable, vulnerable to default. So I think, and I think another bank, I think may, maybe it was TD, don't quote me on that. I think they came out and said they they think two and a half percent of their book could be quote unquote vulnerable. Um, so I'm curious to kind of, you know, gather your thoughts on that. There was one more comment. I think one of the, one of the heads of the bank said something like, let them eat cake. I think it was the other comment that he said. <laughs> well, I was just going to comment. I think the only vote, well, the first vulnerable 
you know, outcome of this is the, the the lives of these these bank CEOs. I mean, how dare them tell you know lower income households that it's their problem, you know that you know they're going to have to deal with it. it. It's a bit of a mess. Not a bit of a mess, Steve. Like it's, it's a huge mess. And it's, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they they say. Remember, but remember though when 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 bankers are talking. They're talking for the for the investment community for for shareholders. They're they're not talking for the, you know, for the community or, or society as a whole. Um, but when society as a whole, if we take our time, we listen to what they're saying. Oh man, like it's it's pretty insensitive comments. You know, if, if I'm running a bank and I say, you know what, yeah, there's some tough times coming up, but it's it's not our fault or it's not our problem. It's not going to hurt us. And we're going to continue to make a lot of money off of your back because we're going to raise credit spreads on all your lending and everything. But you guys, you won't be able to spend as much, you know, won't be able to go to Disney World or, you know, see the Canucks play or or something like that. You know, and and that's what you hear. Um, What I hear, though, is that when they start tossing around the numbers of what their exposure is, and it's, you know, it's nothing to be worried about. Remember? Yeah. You know, our, our subprime losses are contained at four. It's a gully. It's a gully. It's a gully. It's, it's a gully. A lot of motivated people around here. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, but, but that's what I'm hearing. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, for you guys to know as well, um, I'll be doing a real vision um what do they call their their segment like the next big trade or oh yeah the next big trade idea yeah i did one of those on housing those guys (laughs) and uh but i anyway i I have one coming up and uh so you know it'll be a good bit of fun doing it and are you are you focusing the canadian side yeah it'll be a canadian focused uh conversation um Anyway, that's what we'll do with this. So we will let everyone know when it comes out. Uh, but but back to this you know, narrative, when, when the, the banks are starting to throw around numbers of what their exposure is, is it 1%, 2.5%. And like 1% of anything doesn't sound like a lot. 1% of a big number that's levered on top of a smaller number quickly becomes 5% you know, 8%, 12%. And so that's the risk that we have here. So mark down these these comments, these quotes from the banks. And if we do start rolling into recession and the numbers start to change, you're going to see them go from, again, from one to two, to two and a half to three. And, you know, that's when we're going to start to see, uh, you know, some big movement in financial markets coming up. And it, it's all tied together here. But I think... I think it's great that there's transparency and we're able to see it, you know, we're able to talk about it and uh, a lot of people will be discussing it because, you know, that we'll get the bank earnings coming out now soon. And remember how we started, you know, we've been tracking now um, not performing loans, or provision for loan losses and, and all that stuff with banks. And we get another piece of the puzzle coming up. And I, I think it's a very easy path to watch what's happening. Um, yeah, and just to comment on that. So it was actually Scotia Bank. So it was Scotia Bank. They said that um, about twenty thousand of their borrowers uh, they consider vulnerable. Um, and so he says, so as you think about the tail risk, we have about twenty thousand vulnerable customers, which would be two and a half percent of the total portfolio. There she was. It seems like a lot. Um, the other thing we the other thing we can start looking at actually going forward and maybe I can share with which is that there's delinquency data now that that there's um, that's available. Um, sadly, it's it's lagging unfortunately. A lot a lot of these things tend to be, but we now have uh, delinquency data for mortgages across basically all city, if I'm not mistaken, uh, like loads in cities, so like Oshawa and Peterborough and Toronto and whatever it is in Victoria, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, it's it's a quarterly data, but we're definitely something we'll track and we'll keep keep an eye on going forward and we'll definitely share with our listeners. Um, But it remains quite low and falling. So it'd be interesting to see how that starts to change going forward. Because again, I still think we have a lot of this pain coming up. Hey, hey, Rich, in in, in the UK, is the housing 
conversation. I know the housing conversation has always been a, a you know big on everyone's mind over there. But what, what is it like there these days? Is it getting softer or is it still yeah, heated? Very much so. It's it's very much it's it's very much so because of the same issue, basically the same type of issues that you have in Canada. Um, which is to say that all these quote unquote fixed mortgages are not at all fixed. They're, you know, stable for two years or five years. Um, a few geniuses out there have a 10 year fixed mortgages, but that's very, very rare. Um, and if you look at the, something called the, the RICS housing survey, uh, which is the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. Yes, I got that one right. Um, and they have all kinds of housing uh, surveys on new tenants or demand and what have you. And, and virtually all of these uh, surveys are, are down, uh, down, and they tend to lead house price changes, but we know what's going on. There's very little volume, um, and there's the transactions, not only the volumes that are down, sorry, but people are definitely sort of taking their stock off of uh, off these, uh, the right moves, this is the equivalent of the Zillow or um, you know, the, the equivalent of these MLS databases, et cetera. Um, and the year-on-year changes in house prices are, are starting to all about, about to go zero. Um, which is quite incredible. But you're right, uh, Keith, every, housing is always top of mind, especially in London, where it's such an enormous part of people's um, sort of wealth. Um, so their, their balance sheet, excuse me. Are they, um, are they is, is London, you think, like as, as obsessive about like house prices as, as Canada? I think it's more so, believe it or not. <laughs> really? I, yeah, really, genuinely, I believe it's more so. I think everyone's always talking about, um, it's just... It's for, for such a long time, it's been the only way that people can accumulate some kind of inflation protected wealth. You've heard that story before. Uh, in, if you're Canadian, you're very familiar with that. Um, it's the exact same sort of nonsense here. Um, and it's kind of like been, in, it's been implicit in people's sort of retirement plans, how they afford uh, their kids' schools, what, how they can afford renovating their house. You know, the house price goes up, they refinance, they take out equity, they pay for things that they want to do. And then they, you know, they, they move and then the house price goes up and they refinance and they pay for things they want to do, et cetera. You're in a situation where these rate of rates are much, much higher. I think the, you know, the variable mortgage rate in the UK is, is pushing six, six and a half, whatever it is. Um, you know, people have um, the, the loan to values in some cases are very, very high for these new buyers. Um, and, um, you know, there's the anecdotal evidence that I think is coming through, which is, you know, you, you, you bought a house, you had a mortgage of 1.5, your mortgage payments were 1500 pounds or whatever it was. And now mortgage rates are going up to X and then your, 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 your mortgage payments are about to double. And, and maybe, I mean, at, you know, the extreme case, even triple overnight. And so, I mean, yeah, there's going to be lots of pain, um, I think what we should expect going forward is legislation that will be aimed at protecting home buyers from themselves. Again, I don't necessarily agree with that, but that I think is what's going to happen. So you 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 sort of have you you'll I think there'll be legislation that'll hurt the banks, protect that's like a, like a stress test. Yeah, well, that I mean, or just saying like you know you can't you'll have to you'll you'll allow people to renegotiate their um contract or to change the amortization of the loan instead of being 20 years it'll be 40 or what have you i mean oh I know yeah, yeah that's um or or they'll say uh, you know you'll be able to um i mean th- there will be some type of legislation because you know that's what happens when you get housing bubbles you have these stress and all these things that you thought would never possible seem to become ubiquitous um so we'll, we'll see but remember so, sorry one last thing london is a different market right it's 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 you have so much in the same way as Vancouver, right? You have so much out uh, inflows from outside. People hiding their money, uh, or sorry, avoid av- avoiding taxes. I would, <laughs> but you know what? You know, I mean, I'm kidding, but you know what I mean. There, there's a lot of people who just park their cash here. Yeah, it's so a global don't, don't city, care. and people are yeah. just parking it there as as a safe. It's a safe haven. It's it's. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, um, honestly, like people that are buying a lot of these, you know, high end pre sales in downtown Vancouver or penthouses, like it's literally, it's a lot of the times it's just viewed as it's a safety deposit box. Yeah. Um, that's that's what it is. Like they don't, they don't, they don't really interested in renting it out and, you know, collecting their two percent yield. It's just yeah, where well, somewhere to park the cash and. What's dangerous is uh, very much like in, so, you know, Canada and the UK are very different in some ways, but are, are quite similar in their housing market. So you have London would be the equivalent of Toronto plus Vancouver. Let's just lump those two together. And then outside, 
um, let's just pick a random city, Doncaster, England, which is a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere, whatever, no one's ever heard of it. But so, you know, that would be the equivalent of a Moncton. I mean, someone from the UK would never have heard of a Moncton or a Fredericton or what have you. And you would have had an incredible and incredible increase in house prices in those sort of secondary or tertiary cities over the last two or three years that you would have never have had in the previous 15 or whatever, right? So it was that growth value trade but just in this, in in the, in the under the guise of a housing market, right? And so, but but similarly, you know, some of these people who lived in these uh, smaller towns had watched their home prices extreme, uh, increase incredible amounts, aren't necessarily able to afford those house those mortgage increases in the same way that you might have in Moncton, especially if you've pulled out equity or if you're on a variable rate mortgage or what have you. Well, so it's, it's a dangerous game. Uh, yeah. I mean, you've nailed it. Like just on that front, that's just, you can apply the same thing here. Right. Which is like those markets that went up during the pandemic, like they went up crazy and now they're coming off. It's like, those are all the people that predominantly live there and, 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 and own there are predominantly more blue collar working yeah. class. And, and when your cost of borrowing goes up 400 basis points, like they come under stress. Whereas like, Again, if you come into sort of more of the inner city market here in in the core of Vancouver, where we talked about earlier, where a lot of the foreign capital is coming in, a lot of people coming here to park money, uh, store of wealth, that sort of thing. Like a lot of them are coming in all cash or very little to no debt. So it's it's a, just a different it's a different sort of um, buyer profile, I should say. Yeah. So. Um, and that's why, you know, I mentioned, you know, I think on the, we talked about on the podcast last time about like, you know, bottoms and housing markets. What I'm saying is like, you know, some of those markets are, are they're already down 30% with still more room to go, but, yeah. um, they've, they've sold off hard and a lot of them are not quite, but they're getting close to sort of round tripping, um, their increases during the pandemic, getting back to sort of, you know, the round, making the full round trip. Steve, so. besides the uh, you know the the realtor industry there in Vancouver, are you seeing other signs of a slowdown yet, or is uh, it just such a busy place? You know, I mean the pre- really- yeah the pre the pre sale market's slow. Um, you know, you're seeing but like outside develop- of, but outside of the real estate world, like in with the rest of your network. Not really. I mean, I think everyone's just slow. I, I think like, I mean, anecdotally, I think like everybody was like, everyone was like a workaholic during the pandemic. It, t- it felt to me like everyone was working from home and working long hours. And, and I think like now as that's come off, people are just, people have a little bit more time. And so I don't know if that's like pandemic related or just the economy slowing down, but I think that's anecdotally like kind of what I'm hearing, seeing. It's probably productivity, really. I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, like yeah. then you look at like, you know, people like now the, the economy sort of reopened and they can travel, right? I mean, you saw that the travel boom, airfares went way up, hotel rates went up. I think everyone was just overworked and stressed for the last two years. And um, and I think, yeah, I just think like, you know, the housing boom is is unwinding and, you know, with that, people are just taking a bit more time off. I don't know. So it's hard to say, like, I mean, it's funny enough, I'm just looking at, um, you know, reading a research report here on uh, on Canada. So business insolvencies jumped 58% year over year in November with monthly filings hitting the highest since 2019, led by a 74% increase in the construction sector. So I don't know. I think that, uh, you know, similar to that Wall Street Journal article, which we quoted about the Fed paper saying, you know, the wealth effect was responsible for this big boom in inflation. I think the, the wealth effect now coming off with health prices rolling over, I think it's just a matter of time until that that filters through into not only, you know, uh, the economy slowing, but uh, inflation slowing, which we're seeing now. So kind of coming full circle. It's kind of playing out as as one would expect. One thing I'd like to ask for and all of our listeners uh, share with us any anecdotal stories that you have that you are seeing either, yeah, recession is starting or yeah, no sign here. Or, yeah, things are still booming because you know we we continue to look for it, but you know we need to look really hard to, to see it yet. So so uh, that's what I want to see. I, I want to be able to identify. So yeah, it, it is starting to happen. I think that's a good point, though, because like 
I think maybe sometimes I think we're, anyone, myself included, is is subject to confirmation bias. And I think like, you know, the, the negative news always gets amplified, right? So you're scrolling through the, the Twitter news feed and you read, you know, Amazon laying off 18,000 employees and like Facebook laying off. And so it seems to me like, and then you, then you look at obviously like, you know, the jobs data that comes out and you're like, well, you know, the unemployment rate still very low and job openings are still really high and the labor market's still intact. But then again, you get like the big headline that says, you know, Zuckerberg's laying off, you know, X amount of Facebook employees. And so I don't know, maybe unless the job layoffs are confined to the tech space, it's kind of like was metaverse. I thought they changed their name. Meta they Facebook. Did. <laughs> they did. Meta? They, it's meta now. <laughs> I still don't get it. I, I had some it. of those goggles. They're pretty cool. Okay. The meta okay. goggles. Keith, wanna... you got to strap those on, buddy. You'll, your mind will be blown away. <laughs> what is it like? Uh, reality? What do you call the it? The boomer. Look at the boomers. <laughs> you can see virtual the gears reality. Reality. It's virtual Virtu- reality, Keith. <laughs> Why would you? Why you just want to live in the real world? I, I don't understand. I don't. Oh, get it. that's an all-time classic comment. We should talk about clipping. We should definitely clip. That. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with the real world? Oh boy, <laughs> well, that's a fair point. There might be a few things, but it's okay. It's, it's. I want. I do want to see it when you guys have it. We're like, where, where are your goggles? Do you have them? Me? <laughs> yeah. No, this, I. I, this, I, I no, okay, so maybe this is a, a, a Facebook stock analysis here for you. I bought them because I wanted to try them, and I was like, I just need to see what the hype's about. Put them on. I was like, these are really, really cool, and then pretty much never put them on again and sold them. So there you go. So you got bored? I got bored. I mean, it's like there's just not – like it's not developed enough. I mean, I was on there playing, you know, virtual poker. That's pretty cool. Like you can literally like reach out and like, touch someone else's chips and like grab them off the table and like it's really really cool or if you can you can do like an african safari where like you're hovering around and and it feels like you can like literally reach out and like touch like this elephant that's like running at you it's 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 really mind-blowing but it's also like okay now what like you do it for you know an hour or two and like okay i'm bored of this so it's not developed yet i still think like you know, I know they're deploying billions and billions of dollars in that that space. I think it'll be viable, but it's still several years away, at least minimum. Okay, that's All right, uh, there. You go. I didn't think we were going to get there today, but we 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 talked about virtual reality. <laughs> <laughs> virtual reality. Happen? Oh, hey, before I forget, uh, I want to share with uh, you know with, with listeners. Uh, next week, IceCap will be doing a. Um, we're going to have a webinar open to whoever wants to attend, but we're going to be sharing with, with everyone our uh, ice cap ideas and views and where we see markets are heading this year. So if you want to have access to it, just send me an email uh, directly and we'll help you uh, attend. And that's going to be Friday next week, what, whatever that date is, which is Steve, what's the date? Oh, you're boy. asking me i'm not an ice cap oh, come employee on here come on uh, whip it out the january 20th okay january, january 20th. 20th jan 20th here we go jan 20th uh yeah if you have questions about that email keith i'm not involved in it personally but uh, we do love keith um so yeah if you want to obviously participate email keith but i think that's we'll be, probably we won't be calling any bottoms in any in markets we may log in <laughs> keith we might log in as anonymous attendee and ask you uh some inappropriate questions so and that guy those. was he was active last night wasn't he <laughs> yeah yeah we had uh, in the live q a there um yeah. okay i have three more minutes and i have to, to run to a more important meeting <laughs> <laughs> there it is sums up our relationship (laughs) i mean i think that's honestly i think that's a good place to end it i mean you know the news the news flow in january here it's still early days uh the market's clearly trying to figure itself out the direction the fed i think people are optimistic inflation is going to come down and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna find out soon enough we will do a uh a twinkie bet next week uh for the bank of canada again the, they've got a rate hike announcement on january 25th so we'll be gearing up we'll have a, our twinkie bet next week and uh otherwise 
we'll see you again then. So appreciate the help. Uh, as always, if you can give us a five-star review, comment, whatever on Spotify, Apple podcasts, leave us a review. Uh, we appreciate the support kind of helps us jump up in the algos there and uh, continue to build the Looney Hour community. So we'll see you next week.